and I've been able to take a piece of music or even a song from uh, one of these people and write an entire script based on the emotional impact purely of the music. And the archetype is the expression, as Jung said, of instincts, the self-portrait yeah. through a narrative. Mm -hmm. So don't mistake individual characters, whatever they may be, as being archetypes. They're not. The archetype is the story. And that itself is based upon instinct. Of course, the genome wants you to actualize rather than, oh my goodness, there was a sound. And I wonder if this sound is related to the archetype of the wise old mother that lives in the right hemisphere. And things like that. It just sounds a little bit silly to me. Hi everyone, and welcome back to Young to Live By. Today we've got another episode of Ask a Depth Psychologist, our series where we take your questions at the if you're signed up at the ten dollar tier or higher on Patreon and answer it between ourselves. Today's question comes from that what you did not expect from our Discord server, and he says, "I was rewatching some of the older content, and the notion that quote archetypes are the self-portrait of instincts end quote was particularly standout." As is established, archetypes are not experienced directly, but rather through virtual images. This I find to be odd, insofar as that it values only a specific sensory modality, which is sight, or at the least the presenting of images to consciousness imaginatively. If my research and experiences into the field of hypnosis is anything to refer to, then one can safely say that not all intrapsychic activity uses this modality. Therefore, I ask, is it possible for an archetype and therefore an instinct to use a different modality of refined expression that is on the same level of lockstep development as the virtual images, be it a score of music one spontaneously audiates or a poem through some inner voice or just a feeling in one's chest? What do you guys think? Well, thank you for that. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's go back to the major premise or the series of different premises that are involved here. First of all, an observation, uh, your researches into hypnosis probably are informed by NLP from what you, you've said with respect to uh, sensory modalities, and that's entirely valid. What I would say, though, is that when we look at archetypes, let's not have an a priori assumption that they even exist in the sense that they're framed. Let, let's just, just consider that first. Before we move off from that and, and try to investigate them in terms of sensory modalities and representation, do they even exist? That would be the first question that I would ask. Instincts for sure exist. Archetypes, well, the, uh, the quotes from Jung, of course, where he says that archetypes are the self-portraits of instincts. So what he's suggesting is there that they emerge as a product of instincts. So again, he's reaffirming the fact that instincts are, if you like, a priori to them. When it comes to sensory modalities, let, let's again just dial it back and just think about what we're, we're thinking about here. If we change our frame and talk about innate representational systems, things that we're born with, which anticipate experience within the environment. That anticipation must cover multiple uh, sensory modalities. It doesn't have to be visual, but human beings are primarily visual creatures, so the representational systems are going to be primarily in the visual. We'll have the capacity to experience things obviously through the other t uh, senses. Uh, this has survival value. When you bring all of these together, all of them together, within the sphere, if you like, of an innate representational system that anticipates the environment, then you have the activity of instincts. The human cognition of that, the human experience of that, psychologically, but actually more critically, psychosocially and culturally, determines what Jung called an archetypal image. Now, does the archetypal image reflect a so-called archetype, or does it reflect an apperception of the instinct in a representational form? Honestly, I believe that it's that. I don't think there's sufficient evidence that archetypes as Jung constructed the idea or conceived of it. I don't think they exist. I don't think the evidence is strong enough for that. Archetypal images, absolutely, whatever they are. Uh, and I would go to some of Jung's sources for that, such as uh, Emil Durkheim um, and Levi Brühl, um, when they discussed um, collective representations within the culture. Collective representations which are passed on culturally, transgenerationally, to represent learning over time. But that learning has to do with experience. That experience is anticipated biologically. 
within innate representational systems which themselves are part of instincts as such per se. So again, where's the archetype? There's no need for the hypothesis of an archetype. That said, um, yes, representational systems in an NLP sense, um, yeah, why not? Why shouldn't they be part of the instincts? And why should they not then contribute to so-called archetypes? Uh, certainly to archetypal images. Remember, an image doesn't have to be in a visual modality. It's an imago, it's a representation. We have representations that allow us to avoid certain tastes, certain smells, certain sounds. Infrasound, for example, is threatening to most animals because predators generate infrasound just before they strike. In particular, the big cats like lions and tigers, they've been demonstrated to do that. Infrasound, for example, stimulates the fear system and the panic system, causes us to freeze. And if you think of a prey mammal being stalked, say, by a tiger, then the generation of infrasound will give it just a little bit more time, the predator, to uh, induce uh, a freeze reaction in its prey before it jumps on it. So of course, yeah, we are pre-tuned to experience and to respond to the representation of all of the sensory modalities. So, uh, yeah, I think that was a really intelligent question. But as far as my own work goes, I question whether archetypes as described by Jung even exist. Uh, instincts, particularly as they're now understood, both uh, within the neurosciences, specifically the affective neurosciences, within neuropsychoanalysis, and with ethology, which is the study of behaviour in its natural environment, in contradistinction to, say, a psychologist laboratory, they understand instincts properly. It seems to be people who are influenced by either philosophy or um, the more superficial forms of psychology and psychotherapy who are having trouble framing an understanding of instinct. And if they've been influenced by Carl Jung, for example, and the idea of archetypes has taken hold, that's quite a significant impediment to understanding the reality of instincts. Uh, but yeah, that was a really great question. Thank you. Mm. Uh, but what do you think, Paul? I, I think, in short, yes. I think absolutely you can um, experience so-called archetypes um, through different sensory modalities. And sometimes you get a summation of yes. sensory modalities Good operating point, yeah. at the same time when people describe having peak experiences. It, it isn't just usually uh, one modality that they're experiencing. It's usually, a, you know, yeah. several of them or maybe yeah. all of them switched on at the same time and it, it will be context specific and it will it will be different for everyone um, and I, I was thinking a little bit too Steve I know we've sort of said this before of when you write very often music will inspire oh, you yes. to write you don't yeah. necessarily have <clears throat> have images in your mind uh, mm. that you know before you actually produce mm. characters and, and mm. you write your narrative very often it's just that it that connection to instincts and the the affect the emotions that power up as a result of That's that true. that get you going that, that start you mm. uh, on the narrative and and also producing your characters so, that, that's um, a good point yeah uh, apologies I, I forgot to address that very important speci and specific part of your question uh, thank you for reminding me of that Music is incredibly important in generating affect. Uh, the affect itself is the bridge to instinct. Yeah. Um, once you have the emotion, you can then tap into, I'll call them innate narratives, uh, which are the expression of instinct subliminally, unconsciously, which when it reaches consciousness by, a, say, a creative writer, whether that's a novelist or a screenwriter, then those deep structures become woven into a narrative that can express the underlying instincts. That then becomes, for example, when it's communicated externally, in uh, an older culture it would become a myth. Um, if we don't do it that way, it will turn up as a dream. Dreams are hugely important to understand what's going on in, inside dreams, and there's a very, very strong crossover with um, creativity and with filmmaking. Why do we watch films? Why do we watch soap operas? Mm. There's a very, very close overlap between the way a film is structured and a dream is structured. Mm. And music is immensely powerful. I've worked with some very, very top level musicians, some of them world famous, um, and collaborated with them over preparation of scripts. Uh, and I've been able to take a piece of music or even a song 
from uh, one of these people and write an entire script based on the emotional impact purely of the music. I mean, we did work with a, an Australian <coughs> director who, yeah. who didn't see the relevance of music uh, in yeah. film at all. And, um, yeah. An Oscar winner. An Oscar winner, yeah. yes. And mm. uh, that was sufficient for us, to be honest, to, to part company yeah. with him because we, we just went on the same page. Yeah, without music there's nothing. No. And we've worked with some Hollywood people who have said the music comes first yeah. before anything else. Mm. And I agreed, mm. totally agreed yeah. with that because the music is the bridge to the emotion. The emotion is the bridge to instinct. Mm. Instinct is the bridge to your genome and with the anticipations deep within us at that level that end up being expressed as mm. so-called archetypal situations or stories. But archetypes aren't individual characters, they're entire situations. Jung was clear about that, and it's absolutely the case. If you take a, or abstract an individual figure out from a narrative uh, and place them in another narrative where not, none of it works as such, then you don't have an archetype as such with respect to that character anymore. It's a non-playable character. So it's hugely important to understand that it's the whole situation <clears throat> that counts as a so-called archetype. And the archetype is the expression, as Jung said, of instincts, the self-portrait yeah. through a narrative. Mm -hmm. So don't mistake individual characters, whatever they may be, as being archetypes. They're not. The archetype is the story. And that itself is based upon instinct. Just to return to the original question really, really briefly when he's talking about well, he, the, the frame which he sets up, he's talking about instincts and then archetypes and then what seem to be uh, those different sensory modalities emerging from somewhere within yourself. So I, if you take a look at like the personal myth guide that uh, you, you can see on uh, Stephen Pauline's desk there, there's no real reference, uh, it's, it's like passing references, but no real reference to archetypes in there at all. And for the layman in particular, which of course most of these videos are, tend to be geared towards laymen who potentially are interested in becoming clinicians it's uh, th there's no necessary need to understand that deep structure archetypal way of viewing the world like Jung talked about the way we've discussed it before with um, especially Carter 2 of our IPSA students is like just take these things like images and feelings and uh, sounds and stuff like that that emerge naturally from within as just bits of information from the psyche that are going to come forth, almost like remove the theory, remove the frame completely and just say these things simply are. On that front, by the, by the way, we've been see, receiving quite a few emails recently from guys who are interested in our next batch of students, which we will be, technically the website is now live for the next batch of students starting in June. So if anyone's interested in that front, then just shoot, I'll put the, the link to that in the description. If you just shoot an email to contact at youngtoliveby.com, then we can we can set up a call between ourselves to, to discuss an onboarding process. But overall, it's like you just drop the theoretical frame that you know people on the internet have taught to you and instead say, instead go to almost phenomenology and be like, this is my, this is an experience from the psyche. It might mean something and it also might not. That's something we've discussed with the students as well. It's like, what's the difference between a dream and, and a vision? And when should we take account of all of these things? And it's like, well, the ego has a job and the job is not to understand every single internal sign from the unconscious. The unconscious has its job. The ego has its other job. I think people forget that you know, take that uh, that a catabasis process that's discussed in the personal myth guide. Most of the time when you're suffering from something in a self-development sense, you want to get back on track again, rather than understand everything in the psyche as it presents. The, the point is to, to get yourself back together again, so you can then uh, actualize in an extroverted fashion in the world. I think people often forget that, or at least it slips people's minds when they're going through this. It's like, of course you would. Of course the genome wants you to actualize rather than, oh my goodness, there was a sound, and I wonder if this sound is related to the archetype of the wise old mother that lives in the right hemisphere. And things like that. It just sounds a little bit silly to me. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, James. I mean, orientation to the real world uh, it is what it's all about or what it should all be about. Um, you know, I, I'm not denigrating introspection or people who are naturally uh, more uh, introverted than extroverted, but at the end of the day, we do all have to adapt to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right about that. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level, using Steve and Pauline's 40 year long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. 
Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.